Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight where we fight tooth and nail and sometimes tongue in cheek over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. One election ends, a new one begins. A new mayor and council will face an old and familiar issue. And Democrats face a major battle for the party's presidential nomination, plus roast and toast. But we start with our Newsmakers segment and take a deep dive into the results of Tuesday's primary election, where two of the 11 candidates for mayor made the cut and will now face off in a June general election. Joining me to talk about that and more is Professor Beth Von Uppe, head of the Political Science Department at UMKC. Doctor, welcome back to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You know, when most folks look at the results of Tuesday's election, I think they'll look at who won, who lost, and then probably move on. But political scientists will look at a lot more, won't you? Well, we tend to try to figure out why uh, certain candidates won, certain candidates lost. And so we focus on strategies and tactics of the candidates, the issues they addressed, and to see sort of what was the winning strategy and issue combination. You look at turnout? We do look at turnout. Um, but Wasn't in, very big, was it? Well, you know, it was bigger, bigger than it's been in the last two mayoral elections, but it's pretty small compared to any sort of federal election. I think it was 19 or 20% mm -hmm. and, and the two candidates were Julie Justice and uh, Quentin Lucas. Uh, Justice got 12,630 votes and Lucas got 10,287. Not much separation no. there, not big turnout. No, not very much at all. Probably the size of UMKC is <laughs> about uh, all we've got. What issues do you think will be front and center as we head into the battle for the general election in June? Well, I think the two big issues that sort of uh, really uh, are going to solidify over the next couple of weeks are, are issues of economic development, particularly inequity in economic development. That would work for Lucas. Certainly. Yeah. Um, and then I think the housing issue will continue to come up, particularly given that Lucas is heading that committee. And I think we're going to ha hear more about affordable housing or the lack of affordable housing in Kansas City. What do you think will be front and center for Julie Justice? You know, I think she has sort of this um, economic development perspective as well, but it's more sort of continuing the uh, sort of increase in economic development under the James administration. Uh, she's very supportive of what Mayor James right. has done. Right, they're very and, uh, strongly Obviously, connected. he yeah. endorsed <laughs> her and uh, has backed her campaign, and she says, we're on a roll. Right, Let's exactly. continue that. No, and I think he, that's the sort of, you know, we don't have um, parties in mayoral elections, but that is, you know, she's the party of the yeah. <laughs> of Sly uh, James, I'll, Yeah, sure. let me ask you about that, because these are sure. nonpartisan right. elections, as most big city elections mm -hmm. are. But you have small turnout. Right. You have 11 candidates for mayor, and my guess is that at least nine, maybe 10, are Democrats, right. maybe even liberal Probably Democrats. 11. <laughs> Probably 11. Uh, wouldn't it be a more fascinating, energetic campaign if you had to run as either a Democrat or a Republican? It, it might be more interesting sort of as political observers, yeah. but I'm not sure it's better for the city. Um, there's always been this maxim that there's there's no Republican or Democratic way to take out the garbage. And I think that's probably true. So I think I, I thought a lot you were of going to issues. say there's no Republican or Democratic way to do Fix street repair. And in Kansas snow. City, Missouri, there's no way to uh, Oh, fix no, no, no. Ward <laughs> Parkway is, is looking great. <laughs> As an educator, what's your reaction to the massive loss of the uh, pre-K sales tax question? You know, I, I think it's I, I think it's not a question really of the idea of universal pre-K. I think most people are supportive of that idea given the research. It's really the paying for it and the sort of organization behind it. Uh, whether it's really set up in a way that will effectively administer universal pre-K. And I think that's where voters sort of balked. Let me turn your attention for a moment or two to national politics. Sure. Democratic Party seems to have a lot of folks in it now who say yeah. they are democratic socialists. Right, right. And the president's saying they'll never be 
socialism in the United right. States, but we've toyed with socialism a number of times during our history, have we not? We have. I mean, not in the extent to which you would see in sort of some of the European countries, but uh, sort of the socialist experiment generally has has not really played out around the world. But the idea of democratic socialism is nothing unusual in uh, Western Europe. It's you know sort of think of it as just a you know a socialism very very light. Final quick question: uh, There is a move by some to try and eliminate the electoral college. Right. The some are Democrats sure. who are unhappy because. Uh, even though their candidate won the popular vote, lost the electoral vote. Do you think that's any kind of a possibility in the near future? No, no. I mean, it's to, the, to do away with the Electoral College requires a constitutional amendment, and I just can't see that happening anytime soon. And as part of the Constitution as devised by the framers. It, it is, and it, I mean, it's a little different than they intended, uh, how it plays yeah. out today, but it's just too difficult to amend the Constitution. It's endured a long time. It has. As has the country. Thank you so much for sure, coming in. It's absolutely. always a pleasure to talk with you. Appreciate your time. That is UMKC political science professor Beth Von Ami. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. <music> Attorney Jim Heater is a former city councilman and former CEO of the Kansas City Chamber. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Annie Presley is a writer, publisher, and GOP fundraiser. And Ron Freeman is a motivational speaker and writer. It's good to see all of you again. Thanks very much for joining me for today's ruckus. We're going to start by broadening our discussion of the mayor's race and other election results from Tuesday's voting. It was a crowded mayoral campaign with 11 candidates, some very familiar to voters, others making their first appearances on the ballot. There appeared to be no general sense of which two candidates would survive before the voting. Now we know the two winners were Jolie Justice and Quentin Lucas, both first-term council members and both attorneys. Justice was endorsed by Mayor Sly James, Lucas by Freedom Incorporated, neither endorsed by the Kansas City Star. After a short break, campaigning will begin in earnest for the finalists in the mayor's race and city council contest. Now that we know their names, what does the choice of the two finalists for mayor tell us about what voters really want? And we start with Jim. Well, Mike, I think, uh, I think the city of Kansas City was a winner on Tuesday's uh, primary election because what the voters clearly wanted and what they voted for was to advance council members Jolie Justice and uh, Quentin Lucas to the general election in June. And they picked two people who, despite some obvious differences, uh, have an awful lot in common. Both candidates are experienced, uh, both in government. Uh, both have uh, built distinguished careers, um, essentially serving the public through the legal profession uh, outside of government service. Both have high degree of integrity. They're quality people. They uh, care a lot about their city and about its future. So I think they have a lot in common. And I think we'll see a race somewhat akin to what Kansas City saw eight years ago when Mike Burke and Sly James ran for mayor. I think it'll be a clean, honest, above-board campaign. I think there'll be a lot of civil, civility and a lot of mutual respect. And I think the, the candidates, will, the, the city, city voters will get a clear choice uh, in the June general election. Gwen, what differences are there between Julie Justice and Quentin Lucas? Well, you know, on, on the face of things, there's very little difference in terms of their voting record. They both tended to vote for the same economic development issues, tax, uh, tax increment financing for uh, downtown redevelopment. Uh, so I think going forward, Quentin Lucas needs to differentiate himself, and I think what he's going to do is to try to establish himself as being more transparent than Jolie Justice, and I hope that both of them take it up a notch and bring a little bit more excitement to this campaign, because certainly uh, during the primary, I, you know, voter apathy uh, was huge. You can see that based on the voter turnout, but I think the person who comes forward with a whole lot more, who is much more assertive, who is much more uh, forthcoming with a message around uh, tax increment, uh, tax uh, reform, around uh, crime and public safety, uh, dealing with uh, affordable housing, equitable uh, investments on the in the east side, on the urban core. I think that candidate hopefully will inspire voters. Ron, these were both Democrats, probably both liberal Democrats. Would we have seen a more exciting race? Would we see a more exciting race if we had partisan elections? 
I, I don't think so. I, I think what you have in, in I think it's a great idea because you don't have that partisan base. You've got to appeal to all the voters. I think that's where you, the race is going to come down to, excuse me, <clears throat> who can reach across uh, the different boundaries, the east side, the corridor, north town. Uh, all those pieces are going to play a factor in this, and the candidate that can get out there and persuade the most voters. And the turnout was low, something like 19 percent. Does that surprise you at all? Not, not as many people. Well, more people go to a Chiefs game. Than voted, wow. so it's it's a little disappointing. I think um, that it was hard for people to get, grasp how many candidates there were and what they were all about, and that was probably re the biggest reason why people didn't vote. Undecided was still was very very high all the way through, and at the end, when the undecided is over twenty five percent, you've got to believe that undecided basically doesn't vote, and that's what we saw. There was another major question on the ballot uh, on Tuesday, and that was the three eighths of a cent sales tax for pre K education. I think, Gwen, you're solely responsible for its defeat. Uh, <laughs> well, I certainly can't take credit for so. Well, you'd defeating. like to take credit but, for that, wouldn't you? I was very pleased with the outcome. I think the voters, uh, you know, they showed up and they made the best decision for Kansas City uh, relative to uh, no, saying no to adding a regressive sales tax. Uh, everyone is, believes in and supports the expansion of pre-K. And clearly, the school districts who were most impacted by this have plans for pre-K expansion to serve three and four year olds. And those plans have been there all along. And that information was left out of the narrative. So we thought we'd bring that to the light and, and certainly say that we uh, support pre-K expansion going forward. But uh, the voters made the right choice on Tuesday. I was telling Gwen before we started taping the show that I interviewed the superintendent of the Kansas City, Missouri School District last week on Ruckus. And he, like the others, said, I don't want this to pass, and I said it's the first time in my recollection that a public official said he didn't want more money. Right. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Truly a first, don't you think? No kidding. All right. Regardless of the outcome of Tuesday's election and the upcoming election in June, there will be a new mayor and some new players on the 13-member city council. Whatever the makeup, at some point there is bound to be discussion and debate over a topic that is intensified by the tragic, tragic uh, homicide count that persists in Kansas City. Should the city's police department be managed by a locally elected or appointed board, or should it remain managed by a board of commissioners appointed by the state's governor? At a time of significant change in Kansas City, should control of the police department change as well? And we're going to start with Annie. I'll tell you what, I did a little bit of research on this, and there are lots of local people who believe that the police board should be managed locally. But the, the job that the police board is expected to do doesn't really apply to crimes, homicides. They don't really have anything to do with that. They do hiring. But I think the, the board now is local. The mayor is always on it, and, and the state helps us with the expenses associated with it and um, I, unless we can prove that something's going to change in the crime front I don't see any reason to change it at this well, point. Well, I strongly disagree with I that I think you're in favor of city <laughs> control if yes, I remember correctly absolutely. and wouldn't the city and police department be able to consolidate some expenses? Yes. So, yeah, you're right that that a police board does not play a major role in reducing crime. This is really about who controls the the uh, financing and and the administrative decision around the police department. And uh, we are the only city in the country without local control. We had the opportunity to advance it when Sly first took office, and he kind of punted the ball and didn't take the reins and make that happen. We should have joined with St. Louis and we probably would have local control by now. But the point being is that the city provides most of the resources to fund the police department while the governor appoints that board. The city, if, if they had a local board that was appointed by the mayor uh, and more control, um, the mayor gets one seat, therefore one vote on that board. It's not. So I think it's, it's more about the control of finances. If you're putting your money into something in your household, don't you want to make those decisions as opposed to 
through calling somebody oh, down Oh, my the block. life to make them for me. <laughs> uh, Jim, both Annie and Gwen seem to say the board would have no control over how crime is being fought in Kansas City. Why wouldn't it have that control? Well, I think it's a fair statement that, that um, th th there's no direct link to crime in Kansas City, Missouri, particularly the homicide rate, to whether it's local control or state control. I think there are a lot of good reasons now to have local control. State control came about, uh, goodness, almost 100 years ago. Uh, at a very different time when uh, when political machines... It was and after the Pentergast era. Precisely, fact, I think it was 1940. Absolutely. Yeah. It's archaic. It's, it's an appendage to that time. For decades, the city sort of shrugged its shoulders and said, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I think at this point, there are a lot of great reasons to res resume local control. And one of them is, is, as Gwen pointed out, linking directly the funding of the police department through the city budget. It's the city taxpayers who, who, who foot the bill for the police department with their elected officials, the mayor and city council and city manager. Uh, be more transparency, more accountability, uh, and, and a greater a direct link between the funding uh, that the taxpayers shoulder and, uh, and the police department its activities. Well, Ron, let me carry this on a bit farther. Why couldn't the Board of Police Commissioners tell the Chief of Police, here's the policy we want. We want tangible ideas, we want tangible programs, and we want them implemented immediately. Well, I mean, they can, but the thing is, you, to me, the issue of state control, why not have local control? Why, don't we, Kansas, why doesn't Kansas City have the place where we call our own shots? <laughs> I mean, we're having something that happened during the, after the Great Depression, <clears throat> And we're based on uh, the corruption that was here. Then this is a different world and a different environment. There's also a greater sense of accountability for elected officials and public leaders. So I, again, I think there needs to be. Right now, the real problem is who's accountable? What we'll about on the state? No, well, it's local. But it's really a, the crime problem, citizens. Well, you know, the public seems to hold the chief of police accountable for problems that exist in the police department. <clears throat> Maybe they should be holding members of the police board. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I well, think most the decision, people wouldn't know who was on the police board. I think the decision to hire the police chief should be made by people who are accountable to the mayor and the city council because that's how it's funded. The primary revenue for the city for the police comes out of the city operating budget. And, you know, for those five members or six members who are seven members who are appointed by the governor deciding who the police chief is, I think it's, it's just there's something terribly wrong with that All picture. Right, final question. Annie, you know a lot about public relations. Is it bad in terms of public relations for Kansas City to be the only significantly large city in the United States to not have control over its police department, whether it makes any difference or not in the way the department operates? Is it a bad public relations problem? It's pretty unusual. There's no question <clears throat> about it. I, I guess the question is whether or not it actually will change the outcome. And if you follow what's going on in St. Louis, they're having a horrible time getting their transition made. So it, from a PR standpoint, yeah, it's pretty weird. But from an outcome standpoint, as far as crime's concerned, I, I'm not sure there's Actually, any Actually, I have one more final question, and it's going to be to Jim. Uh, this is an old problem for a city council. Are there going to be some other old problems the new council and mayor will face? Like <laughs> yes, deferred be maintenance? Some deferred maintenance. Maybe That's what I was going to say. Oh, you yeah. start with the potholes, and you, and you go to the, the roads, the streets, the bridges, deferred maintenance. It's been a problem here for decades and decades, and it needs to be addressed, and it will be addressed. So the more things change, the more they, the more say they the stay the same. All right, if you thought a lot of Republicans ran for president in 2016, take a look at the Democratic lineup for 2020. Some analysts believe there will be as many as 20 Democrats running, perhaps more. They range in age from the 70s to the 30s, and in philosophy from pragmatism to socialism. At this point, some of the major contenders, according to polls, are Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Beto O'Rourke, Kirsten Gillibrand, Amy Klobuchar, and way too many others to list. Although Biden and Sanders are leading the early polls, some activists of the party believe the nominee must be female or a minority, or maybe best of all, a female minority. So from your perspective as a Republican, Ron, who do you hope the Democrats will nominate next year? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to announce that I will not be uh, <laughs> pursuing the nomination of a Democratic presidential uh, candidate in 2020. Oh, uh, we were so worried. Anyway, no, it's a lot of people were. But no, I think and ideally, uh, I think the reason why it's such a crowded field is everybody perceives the president to be vulnerable. 
But I think ideal candidate would be Bernie Sanders, because here's a guy who is the heart and soul of the Democrat socialist movement. Uh, he would be able to articulate the platform and make it very clear, and then Americans have a choice of who we're going to vote for. And, and it really comes down to that, and to me, in 2020, which direction our country is going to go. Are we going to go down this Democrat socialist path, or are we going to continue being uh, America? Do you, do you think there's a rising tide, a rising tide of support for Democratic socialism on the Democratic Party side? No, I, I don't think. I think there are a bunch of people who think it is. I think they think it's a timing, right? Because, again, you have a president in the White House now who's been uh, attacked in so many ways. Uh, and they believe that our, this time to get that message through, that we're vulnerable and that, that America would go for well, that. And I just don't think we will. The guy who's leading the polls, as we all know, is Joe Biden, but he has his own problems now that really have nothing to do with his position on issues that a president would contend with. Do you have any favorites for the Democratic nomination? Not so much a favorite. I'm actually going to be very interested in the way this uh, shakes out. Um, the Biden? Uh, well, not only, not only the Biden issue, but frankly with all these candidates, because um, what everybody's doing right now is trying to vie for, for a place on the debate stage in, uh, in June. The debates start in June. There will be two successive nights, 10 candidates each. That's 20 candidates. And every candidate out there is trying to get on that debate stage. The reality is it takes an enormous amount of money to wage um, a presidential campaign across this country. So the first quarter of financing reports, which just came in, tell you a lot about who's going to be really a serious candidate in the race. And I think it'll be interesting to see how... Uh, how candidates stack up uh, in the race, whether it's uh, a, a new candidate like uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg or whether it's Joe Biden, uh, who's actually a he's pretty impressive. He's a very he, impressive he, person. Mayor of South Bend, Indiana, I, I, he's been, 37. Yes, uh, I saw him interviewed by Chris Wallace on Fox News, and he handles himself very, very well. Very he, professional. He absolutely does. I was at the Royals baseball game yesterday afternoon with a, a former Republican friend, and I and and he's you have Republican friends. I have maybe lots of Republican, Republican, Republican friends, friends. friends. Although most of my Republican <laughs> friends now are independents these uh, days. A few even are Democrats. But he had told me, he said, I've been so impressed with Mayor Pete Buttigieg, which I never would have expected him to say, but for the exact reasons that you mentioned. So there will be surprises like that along the way. It'll be interesting. Well, I was mentioning in the lead-in that, that some Democrats think it should be a woman nominee, maybe best a minority female nominee. Do you have any interest in that? Uh, yeah, of course I have I don't think you're going to run yourself, but do you have some people? I, I have interest in seeing a woman uh, or a minority uh, nominee. I really want to see the best nominee, the person who can beat Donald Trump. And I, I, I think that this whole notion of <clears throat> democratic socialism as the new way to characterize a liberal is totally ridiculous. And I hope that the party steps up and says, you know, we support uh, a type of an economy that embraces all of Americans and especially those who have the greatest needs. So now we call that socialism. And so I think that the party needs to deal with that. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing who's going to rise to the top. Money is going to be a key issue as to who gets on that debate stage. And we'll take it from there. Well, Bernie Sanders made the term democratic socialism popular in this country. And he's a popular guy he ran well in the 2016 campaign against Hillary Clinton. Now we have all sorts of people coming forward saying they're democratic socialist and they support this idea of a new Green Deal, which is for many people incomprehensible. Uh, do you think Gwen's right that democratic socialism is not really a part of the Democratic Party? Well, they've turned away from it in large part, and Bernie actually was turning a little bit left just to catch up with those new candidates who are so far left on the socialism scale. But truthfully, I like Karl Rove's idea. I think Joe Biden should say he'll run one term, and that's probably the easiest way to get rid of Donald Trump if you want to move him on. That's what well, I think. But, but, you know, who wants yeah. a president to run and say, I'm here for one term, then he has no authority and no influence after day one. Final quick question. <laughs> Mueller report appears at the outset to be favorable for the president. Do you think it will continue to be? Oh, I, I think if there's something there, it would be out already. I think they would. But I, I think the bigger issue here is that he's had this onslaught of criticism, investigation, and really they haven't pinned anything on him yet. And two years into this, we got strong economy, crime is down, and things are moving forward in America. And it's like, how do you make a case against that man? All right. Now we're going to head to the soapbox. It's time for Roast and Toast where the Ruckats have 30 seconds each to stimulate, deviate, or approximate. And first up is Mr. Freeman. Yes. Well, Mike, I'd like to toast the uh, Lee Summit 
uh, community and uh, recent school board elections, elected two fine candidates, Michael Allen and uh, Judy Hedrick, and also choosing to make a stand against being accused as a community as being racist and saying, no, we're not. And uh, to stand up against uh, someone who, from California who'd like to make a claim against a community that's totally unfair and baseless. All right, Jim. Mike, I'd like to toast uh, eight candidates who <coughs> ran for mayor, six members of the city council. Um, Jermaine Reed, uh, Alyssa Kennedy, Scott Wagner, Scott Taylor, Jolie Justice, Quentin Lucas, and then two non-council members, uh, Steve Miller um, and uh, Phil Glenn. What uh, about Clay Chastain? Uh, no, I just, I, I purposely said eight, not part of my name. And the reason I did that is that all eight of those people ran terrific campaigns. If you haven't been close to a mayoral campaign, you probably have no idea how much hard work, effort, resources go into it. Some of those people worked hard for over a year. They ran good, honest campaigns. They love their city. They care a lot about it. So I toast them for having run good, good races. And I hope that uh, since most of them are really pretty young, that they'll continue to be involved for the future of Kansas City. Quickly, Ed, you know of what you speak. You once ran unsuccessfully I, for me. I mayor. know of what I speak. And you knew that you ran unsuccessfully. I didn't have to add that. <laughs> Annie. Well, I have never roasted before, but I am going to roast today because I was very disappointed with the turnout. And um, I think it's super important that we have freedom in America, and one of our greatest freedoms is to express ourselves at the ballot box. And it's time for people to step up and participate. 30 seconds, here, Oh, no, he had a minute. Here, here. We don't have a minute. <laughs> yeah, here, here to Annie's, Annie's toast. I, that's exactly where I was going to go. So I'm going to uh, toast the voters who showed up uh, on Tuesday, all of those who did show up at the polls, and all of those who said no to the regressive pre-K sales tax. All right, and finally, here is a toast to former New York City mayor, billionaire, and Democrat Michael Bloomberg, for his criticism of Joe Biden's so-called apology tour. Bloomberg blasted Biden for apologizing about being white, male, and over 50. By the way, Bloomberg is also white, male, and over 50. Actually, I'm also white, male, and over 50, but not by much. <laughs> and that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, Mike Shannon, saying thanks very much for watching and good night.